nuclear weapons and the discussion around them is everywhere in today's society, especially in light of recent events. For a nation, nukes serve a dual purpose. They let you wipe a city or an army off the face of the earth, and they also dissuade your enemy from invading or attacking you. After all, they wouldn't want their military or their capital annihilated. It is this latter use, as a defensive tool and political bargaining chip, that has made the development of nukes such a high priority for many nations. From their first deployment in 1945, several nations have tried or are trying to develop nuclear weapons, but only nine actually possess them in 2022. The main reason for this is the simple fact nuclear weapons are incredibly difficult to make. From the construction to the geopolitics surrounding them, nuclear weapons are a complex topic, and given their omnipresence in the world, it's worth exploring and understanding them. Compared to conventional weapons such as bombs and firearms, the science and engineering behind nuclear weapons is much more novel and much more modern. The scientific phenomenon behind nuclear weapons, nuclear fission, was only discovered in December 1938, but its destructive potential was quickly realized. Nuclear fission occurs whenever an energetic neutron strikes the nucleus of a sufficiently large atom, uranium for example. If the neutron carries enough energy, the uranium nucleus will be split apart releasing energy, lighter atoms, and neutrons in the process. These neutrons carry energy and can split further atoms, leading to a nuclear chain reaction and the release of incredible amounts of energy in the process. The design of nuclear weapons is based on manipulating a nuclear chain reaction and a heavy core of uranium or plutonium. These elements are chosen because they can undergo spontaneous fission, meaning they can both start and sustain a nuclear chain reaction. This chain reaction is caused by bringing the core from a subcritical state, where a chain reaction can't be sustained, to a supercritical state, where it is. The criticality of the core is determined by factors such as its mass, density, and shape, and pushing it from subcritical to super is done by the actual bomb itself. The earliest nuclear weapon designs come from the Manhattan Project, the United States Nuclear Research and Development Program. Top physicists such as Glenn Seaborg, Edward Teller, and Robert Oppenheimer headed the research effort, and rudimentary designs were drafted in the first year of the project. The earliest nuclear weapon designs involved shooting together two subcritical pieces into one supercritical core, or using explosives to compress the core into a supercritical state. Both designs were present in the bombs used against Japan in World War II, and they both proved devastatingly effective. In less than a decade, the power of fission had been discovered and subsequently utilized, killing thousands in the process, and ending a war ravaging the world. However, not all theories postulated by the Manhattan Project had been tested or confirmed. The head designers of the program proposed methods of improving the efficacy and lethality of nuclear weapons, but were not adopted due to time constraints and technical limitations. Dropping the bombs in Hiroshima and Nagasaki opened a Pandora's box, however, and these cruel improvements would later be explored. The Manhattan Project focused almost exclusively on the development and weaponization of fission technology. I say almost, because the head researchers proposed nuclear fusion and bomb design at one point. Nuclear fusion is effectively the opposite of fission. Two lighter atoms are combined or fused together, yielding a heavier atom and a massive amount of energy. Fusion is an extreme process, typically occurring only in the core of stars or in particle accelerators. Because of this, Actually utilizing this phenomenon has been extremely difficult, best evidenced by the fact fusion power has been in the works for around 80 years to little avail. However, there is one exception to this extreme technological difficulty, nuclear weapons. We mentioned earlier that nuclear chain reactions release incredible amounts of energy. In a fission bomb, this is in the form of a massive shockwave, along with temperatures rivaling the core of the sun. The ungodly heat and extreme pressure is enough to fuse lighter elements such as hydrogen, a property that would be exploited in the second generation of nuclear weapons. Thermonuclear weapons, nukes utilizing fusion, are differentiated from their fission-based counterparts by the addition of a secondary core. Whereas the primary core undergoes fission, 
the secondary undergoes fusion along with additional fission. The secondary is essentially a uranium cylinder containing fuel for fusion along with a core of uranium or plutonium. Thermonuclear weapons work by first triggering the primary fission core. The heat and pressure released by the initial explosion compresses and heats up the secondary, in turn leading to fusion. The fusion process produces neutrons, which causes both supercriticality in the secondary core and fission in the uranium container around it. The result is an explosion of unparalleled destruction, orders of magnitude more powerful than a fission-only nuke. Because of this, thermonuclear weapons were rapidly adopted by various world powers and still remain the standard design of modern nuclear arsenals. Nuclear development is a closely guarded state secret. Though we have no hard numbers on the total cost, estimates for the United States arsenal are in the trillions. Developing a nuclear weapon is extremely expensive, with the biggest cost being the core. Fission cores are made from two elements, uranium and plutonium. Looking at uranium, it's fairly abundant on Earth and inexpensive at that, but it cannot be used on its own in a nuclear weapon. This is due to the percentages of uranium isotopes in natural samples. Isotopes are atoms of the same element, but with a different number of neutrons. In the context of nuclear weapons, different isotopes undergo fission in a different manner. Looking specifically at uranium, the two most relevant isotopes are uranium-238 and uranium-235. Whereas both can undergo fission, only the lighter uranium-235 is fissile, meaning it's able to generate a sustainable nuclear chain reaction. Uranium-235 is the isotope sought after for nuclear weapons, but is only 0.7% of all uranium on Earth. Given that uranium fission cores need to be about 90% uranium-235, the target isotope needs to be separated from bulk uranium, a process known as enrichment. Uranium enrichment is as costly as it is dangerous, evidenced by the Manhattan Project's developmental death toll and price tag. Modern uranium enrichment is typically done by centrifugation, the separation of gaseous uranium by weight. Uranium's boiling point is kinda high, meaning the pure element can't be enriched on its own. Instead, metallic uranium is converted into uranium hexafluoride, an extremely dangerous compound that boils at a much more manageable temperature. Once a gas, the uranium hexafluoride is pumped through a centrifuge, basically a massive spinning fan that causes lighter gases to float and heavier gases to sink. Because the isotopes differ in weight by less than a percent, it takes dozens if not hundreds of rounds of centrifugation to yield weapons-grade uranium, a long, laborious, and expensive process from start to finish. Plutonium is the other element utilized in fission cores. Unlike uranium, plutonium does not exist in any appreciable quantity on Earth, so must be synthesized instead. Quite simply put, if a neutron collides with uranium-238 and it doesn't cause fission, there's a decent chance it will be captured by the nucleus, forming uranium-239 in the process. Uranium-239 is an unstable isotope that quickly decays into neptunium-239 and finally plutonium-239. To produce usable quantities of plutonium, specialized breeder reactors are constructed that irradiate uranium with large amounts of neutrons, turning it into plutonium in the process. Similar to uranium, only specific isotopes of plutonium can be used in a fission core. Plutonium-239, the first isotope produced in these reactors, is the target isotope, being both fissile and relatively safe to handle. However, as the reactor continues to run, it will begin to irradiate the plutonium with neutrons, turning it into plutonium-240. Plutonium-240 is not fissile and causes a nuclear chain reaction to progress too quickly, preventing the full fission of all material in a core. For weapons-grade plutonium, no more than 7% can be plutonium-240, otherwise a core made from it would be too unreliable and inefficient. Attaining this purity requires the slow and careful operation of breeder reactors, which, much like uranium enrichment, is another difficult and costly process. Finally, fusion core production is a similarly expensive procedure. The most common fuel used for fusion is made of lithium-6 and hydrogen-2, commonly known as deuterium, and isotopic separation is necessary for both materials. Bulk lithium has two isotopes, lithium-6 and lithium-7, with the latter being much greater in abundance. 
However, one odd property of lithium-6 is that it reacts much more readily with mercury compared to lithium-7, a property that is exploited to separate and acquire usable quantities of the isotope. For deuterium, a trace amount of this isotope is found in seawater. Large, heavy water facilities are used to siphon, separate, and distill seawater to acquire deuterium for scientific, industrial, and military application. In short, the scientific basis of nukes, the incredible and unique intricacy of nuclear science, is an enormous hurdle. The development of nuclear weapons requires a level of infrastructure and technology few could possibly possess. This hurdle is undeniably a blessing, as the potential harm, the extreme danger posed by nukes, is severe, to say the least. At the beginning of this video, we mentioned how nukes are desirable both for their destructive potential and political utility. The concept of MAD, or Mutual Assured Destruction, is the basis of this latter point. The idea is that if nuclear war were to break out, no country would be able to stop the hundreds of warheads launched at it. This makes the use of nuclear weapons a lose-lose situation, preventing their usage in the first place, and protecting both parties in the process. MAD has been the predominant theory of nuclear deterrence since its inception in the 60s. While it has held since that time, it unfortunately does not account for fringe cases seen in our modern world, terror cells, fanatical leaders, and the insane. Any one of these groups may view the destruction of their enemies as more important than their own survival, and if they actually choose to push the button, the consequences would be beyond horrific. The detonation of a nuclear weapon on a city center or a highly populated area would, first and foremost, annihilate that region out to several miles. No building can withstand the extreme heat and shock wave of the blast, and any person caught within would likely perish. Outside of the immediate kill radius, third degree burns, uncontrollable fires, and earthquakes are caused as well. While the physical damage brought on by a nuclear explosion is extreme, it is but one part of the overall impact. The fission and fusion of the internal cores generates enormous amounts of ionizing radiation, leading to acute radiation poisoning, cancer, and death. In addition, large amounts of radioactive isotopes are produced by the explosion, poisoning the surrounding area for years due to the resultant fallout. Finally, nuclear weapons can have severe environmental impacts outside of the immediate destruction and irradiation. Predictions show that if an industrial or urban region were to be nuked, enormous amounts of ash, soot, and smoke would be produced from the destroyed infrastructure. The explosion would launch this debris into the stratosphere, blocking sunlight from reaching the surface, and leading to widespread global cooling, nuclear winter. Nuclear winter is, arguably, the biggest risk associated with a nuclear launch, and while even a single nuke could destabilize the environment, it would take only 10 to 100 nukes hitting their target to fully trigger this phenomenon. The global cooling effects of a nuclear winter are severe, with models showing average global temperatures dropping as much as 8 degrees, with even further drops inland. A sufficient amount of food cannot possibly be produced in these conditions, leading to the starvation of untold billions. In short, nuclear weapons don't just threaten the cities they're aimed at or the suburbs surrounding them, but the world as a whole and their mere existence is a genuine existential threat for humanity. Nuclear weapons are unique in the threat they pose. No singular weapon has such terrifying, mankind-ending power. And it's for this reason that nuclear disarmament is so popular and so important. Efforts to reduce the size of the global nuclear arsenal have been ongoing for decades, with some of the first successes occurring in the 1980s. After the Chernobyl disaster in 1986, both the US and USSR were given a sober reminder of the power of the atom. In line with this, the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty was signed by both parties in 1987, preventing the use of short to mid-range missiles and leading to the decommissioning of nearly 3,000 nukes. Shortly after this treaty was signed, the Soviet Union began to collapse. As tensions loosened between the US and the former Soviet Union, the need for a gargantuan nuclear arsenal seemed less necessary for both sides, leading to even further disarmament. 
Ever since, the total number of nuclear weapons on Earth has been on a constant downtrend. While some states continue their efforts to produce nukes, and others still work on their development, there is a broad commitment across the globe to limit and reduce their presence. At one time, we had the ability to destroy the world 600 times over, but through a commitment to peace and safety, we've dropped that to only 130. Hopefully in time, even the most capricious leaders of this world will understand the threat posed by nuclear weapons, and we can bring that number down to a more... comfortable level. Thanks for reaching it to the end. Before going into some final thoughts on the topic, do please like, subscribe, and share the video around if you enjoyed it or learned something interesting. It would really mean a lot. With all that being said, I'd like to first bring up another point on uranium enrichment I wasn't able to cover in the video proper, that being Silex. Silex, the separation of isotopes by laser excitation, is a piece of uranium enrichment technology currently in development that works by using lasers that preferentially excite uranium-235, separating it from bulk natural uranium in the process. While this technology is currently in the experimental phase, if it were to be fully developed, it would be much more efficient and substantially smaller than any current isotopic separation methods currently being utilized. While technological advancement is generally beneficial, Developing a system that could quite feasibly allow for the faster and easier development of nuclear weapons is a questionable pursuit. To that end, the Australian private company who developed Silex is unique in that they are the only private entity to have their information classified by the United States government. A bit of an odd move, especially on a legal level, but ultimately probably for the best. Regarding the overall video itself, the topic of nuclear weapons and nuclear science is one that I'm personally really interested in and fascinated by. I studied chemistry in college, and while topics of nuclear chemistry and nuclear physics were not heavily covered in my classes, I was always really into these subjects when they were discussed. To that end, I actually really enjoyed the research process for this vid. That being said, actually developing the video itself was challenging. The topic of nuclear weapons, if covered in full, is extremely dense. Properly crafting some sort of narrative or logical progression of the facts is challenging when there are just so many disparate topics to account for. Nonetheless, I believe I've provided a more than sufficient overview of nuclear weapons and the myriad phenomena surrounding them, and encourage everyone to further explore the topic. Feel free to leave a comment on what you found most interesting during this discussion, and of course let me know if I missed something. With that, thank you once again for making it to the end of the video, and until next time, take care.